Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's eight o'clock in the morning, Thursday. So to start this class, I would like you to listen to Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce, and Ginger Baker. Listen to the lyrics. They call it Stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. You're back to school, and Monday was stormy for you. Tuesday was bad, Wednesday was worse. I hope that from today onwards, Thursday will no longer be sad, thanks to my problems in international politics. Lectures, you know that the COVID crisis prevents us from having face-to-face -face classes, face-to-face -face lectures. So I decided to record my lectures, to put them on uh, on a video, to put the video on YouTube. You will find, of course, on the Moodle page of Sciences Po, Sciences Po's website, you will find various material, the syllabus of these lectures, the course outline, uh, various uh, videos too, more serious ones, obviously, or more relevant ones, I would say, and different documents, excerpts that I refer to to illustrate various points of the lectures. You will also find the details that you need to know uh, regarding the exam, what the exam will um, consist in in December. So the objective of this uh, course on problems in international politics is to have a look at contemporary issues uh, through the um, academic, through the scientific lens of the discipline of international relations. How can we analyze the rise of China? How can we analyze America's uh, foreign policy or Trump's foreign policy? Um, the perspective uh, role of um, the European Union, the future of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the causes of um, the Palestinian Israeli Palestinian conflict, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, uh, Russia's behavior in Ukraine, global terrorism, etc. How can we look at all these topics through the looking glasses of international relations theory? Those who took my uh, introductory lectures to international relations, to international relations theories, know that I consider 
these theories to be as much an end in themselves and the means to better understand, to identify, describe, and explain uh, past or, in this case, contemporary uh, problems. The aim is to permit you to do so too. Of course, the analyses that I will put forward are um, personal ones. There are no objective analyses in social sciences. There are only more or less rigorous ones. My objective is to incite you to think by yourself thanks to these, I hope so, rigorous concepts. So today we will start, if you look at the syllabus, today we will start uh, with a look at the contemporary international interstate system. Is this system unipolar or is it unipolar no more? And I would like to start this analysis with a speech held by Barack Obama. It was his last State of the Union address in 2016, so a bit less than four years ago, where he gave his view of America's preeminence. Listen to Barack Obama, please. I told you earlier, all the talk of America's economic decline is political hot air. Well, so is all the rhetoric you hear about our enemies getting stronger and America getting weaker. I mean, let me tell you something. The United States of America is the most powerful nation on earth, period. Period. It's not even close. It's not even close. It's not even close. We spend more on our military than the next eight nations combined. Our troops are the finest fighting force in the history of the world. nation attacks us directly or our allies because they know that's the path to ruin. Surveys show our standing around the world is higher than when I was elected to this office and when it comes to every important international issue. People of the world do not look to Beijing or Moscow to lead, they call us. People claims Obama, people look to Washington when they need help. Washington, the US are the leader of today's world. Why did they choose this excerpt of Obama's final State of the Union address to illustrate this topic? Well, because of course, Obama claims that America still is the most powerful nation on earth. And ever since Trump came to power, we know that he considers America to be great and actually the greatest but but maybe the mere fact that obama and also trump feel compelled to emphasize that america is still the greatest nation the fact that obama replies to those who say that america is declining that actually america is not committed in decline, maybe this mere fact somehow tends to indicate that he is no longer that sure about America being preeminent. Maybe he is gradually wondering whether the US still is or not the preeminent nation in the world. So then let's try in today's class to give an answer to this question. Is the contemporary international or interstate st system still unipolar or not? And in order to do so, of course, we have to ask a question and provide an answer to the question, what is an international system? An international system, ladies and gentlemen, is defined as a set of states having regular interactions among each other. Having interactions regular enough to make the behavior 
of each unnecessary element in the beha behavior of every other state. In other words, to put it differently, every state before acting on the international scene has to take into account the other state's prospective actions and reactions. Why is this the case? This is the case because of anarchy characterizing the international system, international relations. But this is the starting point of at least mainstream international relations theories, anarchy. International relations take place in an anarchical environment. There is no authority above states. And since there is no authority above states telling them what they do, what they should do, and what they should not do, and maybe sanctioning them in the case they would adopt an inadequate behavior since there is no such authority. States, states when acting, act on the basis of their relative power. That is to say, the power, their power, resources compared to the other states' power. Logically then, to study an interstate system and to provide an answer to the question whether it is still not unipolar, to have a look at an international system, to study an international system, is actually amounts to a study the power distribution among the major units of the system. How many powers are there? How do they behave when interacting with one another? And the guideline to uh, provide answers to this question, the guideline to the kind of scientific study of the international system, is a typology distinguishing the power polarity from the cluster polarity. The power polarity, for, first of all, the power polarity of a system refers to the distribution of capabilities among the units. Roughly how many units are there possessing significant uh, power capability. And logically, scholars distinguish three kinds of structures. A system can be unipolar, where there is one major power, preeminence, and therefore dominating all the other ones, which therefore by definition are merely secondary powers. A system can be bipolar. Bipolarity refers to a system characterized by two major units, and the other states cannot but adhere to one of the two camps, to one of the two blocks, to one of the two alliances that were created by the two major powers. And then multipolarity also exists. It's the third, time, the third type of um, structure. Multipolarity, of course, exists when there are at least three major powers possessing roughly the same amount of resources, material resources. So this is power polarity. Then we have also to have a look at cluster Polarity cluster is a term which is pretty often used for some months now because of the pandemics. Cluster refers to the possible organization of the system. That is to say, the fact for these states to come together, to flock together, to, to, to band together, to form thus a kind of alliance or a block. And therefore we can distinguish processes of unipolarization, of bipolarization, or of multipolarization. Multipolarization exists when various states no longer form rigid alliances, as is the case in a bipolar system, and or when in the unipolar system there is a kind of process favoring the rise of three, four other secondary powers, no longer secondary, if by definition they become powerful enough. Bipolarization means the process uh, of a unipolar system becoming bipolar because of the rise of one single uh, contender or competitor, or when a multipolar system tends to become bipolar but is not bipolar yet, it is getting bipolarized mainly due to the fact that uh, the, the multipolar powers, at least three, four major powers, do form rigid alliances, two rigid alliances. 
And unipolarization, of course, describes the progressive emergence of one single major power uh, out of either a multipolar or a bipolar. There can be, therefore, strictly speaking or theoretically speaking, pure systems and mixed system, hybrid system. So if we go back to history, the examples of pure systems are the pure bipolar system of the Greek uh, city-states system, roughly five, four centuries before our era, there was a bipolar system. Athens and Sparta were the major powers and they created two alliances. Therefore the system was also bipolarized. And it is this bipolarized system which was at the origin of the, the Peloponnesian War described by Thucydides. Another example of a pure system is the 19th century. The 18th century, the 17th century, actually maybe more the 18th than the 19th century. We come back to this because of course all the different scholars, be they historians or international relations scholars, do not agree when they analyze the structure of different uh, different systems, we come back to this too. So the 18th century, the 17th century was multipolar and multipolarized. There were three, four, five major powers, European ones, of course. And they practiced a shifting alliance strategy that is to say there was no rigid block. So no uh, bipolarization. But there are also mixed systems. The mixed system, an example of a mixed system is the eve of World War I, there were six major powers, uh, Great Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria, and Italy. And this multipolar system gradually uh, turned bipolarized because two rigid alliances were formed at the origin of World War I. The Triple Alliance uh, formed by the Germans, the Austrians, and the Italians, and the Triple Entente, the Russians, the British, and the French. Maybe even the second part of second half of the Cold War can be characterized as a hybrid system. The system was bipolar because there were two major powers, the US and the USSR, but France, Germany with its Ostpolitik, France with De Gaulle uh, deciding that France should leave um, the integrated military command of NATO and China no longer uh, obeying Moscow. Uh, the, the system was bipolar, but to some extent, maybe, at least this analysis that has been pr proposed, the system became multipolarized gradually. So if we apply these concepts and these uh, types of structures to the contemporary world, to the post-Cold War world, what does nowadays structure looks like, look like? Is it unipolar? Is it multipolar? Is it bipolar? What about the cluster polarity is the system getting committed in a unipolarization or bipolarization or multipolarization process? I will have a look first at those predictions, those anticipations, those forecasts that were proposed immediately after the Cold War came to an end, immediately after the Berlin Wall collapsed. Indeed, the end of the Cold War, since it was a surprise for everybody, nobody expected in the 80s when I was a student, nobody expected the end of the Cold War, nobody all the less so expected the peaceful end of the Cold War. And so everybody or a lot of scholars or pundits, experts, journalists try to imagine the post-Cold War world. I would like to uh, refer to two major scenarios that was that were proposed. The first one proposed by the American um, expert or journalist Charles Krauthammer. The unipolar moment in the documents that I proposed to you. This is his analysis. You can have a look at it, uh, download on Moodle, and then read it. It's the unipolar moment scenario proposed by Krauthammer in the foreign affairs with the issue of 1990-1991. So uh, almost exactly 30 years ago. So according to Krauthammer, the Cold War was a bipolar system. US versus the USSR, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. 
And of course, first, first there was a pact, or the East European so-called popular democracy, the communist regimes crumbled. And a little bit later, uh, December 1991, the USSR itself uh, collapsed. So Krautama expects the world to be unipolar because of the fall, because of the, the, the decline, very uh, rapid, quick decline of one of the two major powers. Since the system was bipolar, one of them no longer exists. Logically, the system will become unipolar. Listen to Charles Krautama, you can have a look at the document. There is today, this is what he wrote, there is today no lack of second rank powers. Germany and Japan are economic dynamos. The Great Britain and France can deploy diplomatic and to some extent military assets. The Soviet Union, it was still existing in December uh, 1990. The Soviet Union possesses several elements of power, military, diplomatic and political, but they are all in rapid decline. This is the statement of Charles Krauthauer. And once he put forward this statement, he then comes to his analysis of what the future would consist in, the immediate post-Cold War world, this is what he wrote, is not multipolar. It is unipolar. Unipolarity will be prevailing. The center, I go on quoting, of world power is the unchallenged superpower, the US, attended by its Western allies. American preeminence, he said, is based on the fact that it is the only country with the military, diplomatic, political, and economic assets to be a decisive player in any conflict in whatever part of the world it chooses to involve itself. So America, if it involves itself on the world stage, will dominate the world. Unipolarity. So, from the American point of view, of course, a pretty optimistic prediction. But Krautama is a little bit less optimistic than that, because he thinks that this unipolarity will be anything but stable. He does not, he does not either think that it will last long, that is to say, it will be durable in time. Why? Because he considers that then strategic environment will be characterized, I quote, by the rise of small aggressive states. He calls them weapon states because they are armed with weapons of mass destruction. The article was published in December 1990. Iraq had invaded uh, Kuwait in August 1990 and America and its allies had not yet intervened to force Saddam Hussein to withdraw. So he considers that the rise of states armed with weapons of mass destructions and possessing means to deliver them, that is to say missiles, he considers that this fact, I quote, makes the coming decades a time of increased rather than diminished threat of war. So the system will not be stable. It will not be peaceful. America will have to confront uh, these threats emanating from weapon states. So Krautama changed his mind a little bit later at the eve of Operation Iraqi Freedom against Saddam Hussein, launched in 2003 by uh, George Bush, um, George W. Bush, George Bush Jr. He considers that in a second article called The Unipolar Moment, revisited that actually unipolarity lasted longer than, than he had prevailed in 1990. So he, in the second analysis, he announced a fairly long lasting American preeminence, a new kind of American century. American century is an expression that was coined in the midst of World War I, oh, World War II, sorry, during the World War II by an American journalist, Henry Luce, at that time head of the Time magazine. The American century. So unipolarity, according to uh, Krauthammer, a uh, unipolarity, however, uh, not, not, not necessarily stable. Second scenario was put forward uh, some three and, and a half years later uh, in 1994 by former American Secretary Henry Kissinger in his huge book called Diplomacy. A very big book, 900 pages, where 
uh, Kissinger analyzes past centuries, past international systems, and tries to uh, foresee what will happen in the future. Kissinger, before being the Secretary of State or the National Security Advisor, Frederick Nixon, then of uh, Ford in the end of the 60s, at the beginning of the 70s, he was a historian, a professor of history of international relations uh, in Harvard. And being a historian, he bats on the revival of past historical patterns. There is no, he's a realist, there is no progress in history according to realists. International politics nowadays will look like it looked in the past. This is what he wrote. Nations in the past have more frequently competed than they have corroborated. And there is little evidence, I quote, to suggest that their behavior has changed or that it will change in the future. So what does he foresee? He foresees or he foresaw 30 years ago, that's 25, 26 years ago, he foresaw a multipolar system similar to the one that prevailed in past centuries in Europe when Europe was dominating the world. However, this system, because nowadays it is worldwide and no longer focused on mere in Europe, Western Europe or Europe in general, this system being worldwide will be characterized by five or six major powers, the US, Russia, China, Japan, India, and maybe Europe. Maybe Europe in the case, according to Kissinger, Europe will be able to form a united, a unified entity. We'll come back to this topic in one of our chapters dealing with uh, the so-called European normative power. So all these major powers will act egoistically on the world stage. Their national interest is a typical realist claim, will be defined egoistically and thus they will clash. And they will have conflicting interactions. America in this new multipolar system will be the strongest, but merely one power among others. A nation like others, I call it. So the, the best means to uh, maintain a, a stability in such a multipolar order will consist in uh, maintaining the balance roughly among the different states and also taking into account different cultures different cultures may when he put forward this idea uh, Kissinger was indirectly influenced by uh, by Samuel Huntington's clash of civilization thesis but anyway he's a secondary from our point of view today Kissinger also changed a little bit his mind. He published a new book in 2014, which is called World Order, where he focuses on China and Russia and no longer on India, Europe, and Japan. Anyway, 30 years after uh, Krauthammer's prediction, 25 or 26 years after Kissinger's prediction, who's wrong and who's right? This is the question I would like to ask. What does the empirical reality tell us? Is the system unipolar, as claimed by, multi, by uh, Krautama, or is it multipolar, as thought by Kissinger? By asking this question and by proposing this alternative multipolarity versus unipolarity, I straight away exclude the thesis of a non-polar world in America, also in France. Some people emphasize the fact that the system nowadays would be non-polar, non-polarity. No, no major power, in other words, would prevail because of the diffusion of power among states and also among non-state actors, be they sympathetic one, ONGs, um, NGOs, sorry, non-governmental organizations, or less sympathetic ones like terrorist networks or criminal networks. So this is the thesis put forward by Richard Haas, in the third article that you can find in the file, if you have a look at it, which I pass this non-polarity thesis, I exclude it. I, I do not think that the system can be non-polar. There are major powers in the contemporary. So is the system unipolar or is it multipolar? Spontaneously, spontaneously, we might be tempted to agree with Krauthammer for the reason that I mentioned there were two major powers uh, from 45 to 89, 1991, the US and the USSR. The USSR collapsed, so two minus one, only one remains. 
But Krautama, when he put forward this uh, uh, prediction and uh, beyond uh, the fact that he himself did not think that such a system would be stable and durable, beyond Krautama and beyond Kissinger, all the then prevailing realists, if whatever type, classical or neo, offensive or defensive realists, thought that the system could not be unipolar. So listen to Kenneth Waltz, the Pope of neorealism. This is what he proposed as an analysis in 1993 in an article called The Emerging Structure of International Politics. This is what he wrote, balance of power theory leads us to predict. Balance of power theory leads us to predict it. Other powers will try to bring America into balance. Other powers will try to put an end to America's preeminence that was existing when he wrote his article in 1992-1993. Hegemony leads to balance. If there is one prevailing power, hegemonic one, come back to this term, this will incite other states to rebalance the system. So unipolarity will not prevail. And he goes as far as saying, I quote, this is now happening. Now states try, start to balance America's hegemony. This is now happening. Though the US has still benefits to offer to other states. And the second author is John Mearsheimer, a non-offensive neorealist. I will come back to him in a few minutes. But in his analysis of the post-Cold War world, which he published in various articles, also in his book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, in this book and in various articles, Mersheimer, just like uh, Kissinger, though being a neorealist and not the classical world, considered that multipolarity would prevail with a greater risk of instability. Listen to Mersheimer, the multipolar distribution of power characterized the European state system from its founding with the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, up to 1945, and then became back. So multipolarity from 1648 to 1945, three long centuries. We know that this multipolar European state system was plagued by war throughout the centuries. So wars were, war, wars were uh, breaking out regularly. Europe is reverting to a state system that created powerful incentives for aggression in the past, and he expects new aggressions in the future. So Mishama too changed his, uh, his analysis, he changed his mind implicitly and thus contradicting himself, implicitly accepting the idea that unipolarity actually started after 1990 and focusing just like Kissinger on Russia and China as the challenges of the US. Listen to Mirshama. It is an interview that he gave to uh, a Russian uh, academic. Listen to Mirshama and first the Russian expert who presents, makes a presentation, introduces, sorry, who introduces John Mirshama. I'm very, I'm very happy as a student of international relations. I am very happy to welcome uh, with Valdai Talks, the, one of the most famous and most prominent scholars in the field of the theory of international relations, Professor John Marshammer from the University of Chicago. Sir, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And uh, my first question is actually about what worries most of the people in this country and in some other countries. What place do you see, what role do you see in the international system of the future for the three new most important nuclear powers, namely China, Russia, and the United States. Yeah, as uh, I have said on numerous occasions, we're now entering a world uh, where the United States is no longer uh, the only great power on the planet. We're moving out of a unipolar world to a multipolar world, where there are three great powers that really matter for shaping the international system. One, of course, is the United States, which will remain the most powerful state for the foreseeable future. China, which is the real challenger to the United States, and Russia. And I think when students think about the future of international politics, they want to think about what are going to be the relations among those three countries. 
And my view is that today, relations between Russia and the United States dominate the headlines. That's what everybody talks about, not only here in Russia and in the United States, but all around the world. And it appears that those are the two central players in the story. But uh, I think that's only true uh, for the present and for the immediate future. I think that over the long term, the defining relationship uh, in international politics will be the competition between China and the United States. China is a potential peer competitor to the United States. It has, assuming that it continues to grow, uh, it will have the power uh, to think about dominating Asia. And the United States, of course, will not tolerate that and will push back and go to great lengths uh, to prevent China from dominating Asia. So that competition between the United States and China will eventually be the defining uh, factor in the international system. Now the question becomes where are the... So the rivalry between China and the US will define the future system. This is what John Mearsheimer uh, says. Uh, he contradicts himself because he the, the interview uh, was held in 2017, so three years ago, and he says that the, the system is no longer unipolar, which amounts to saying that it was unipolar, at least up to 2017. He contradicts what he wrote in 1990 when he anticipated multipolarity. Anyway, nobody's perfect. We all do adapt our analysis, of course, to the uh, to, 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 to reality, to empirical, the evolution of empirical reality. I would like you, uh, I would like to you to, to have, a, to, to listen to the, to the rest of the interview too. I interrupted it here and it's longer than that. Because Meshama also makes um, um, a plea in favor of IR theory. That is to say, he, uh, uh, in this interview, he emphasizes why students, be they uh, old people or be they young people like you, uh, why students should use IR theories to better understand the world they are living in. So my analysis then, when compared to Krautama, to uh, Kissinger, to Waltz, to um, uh, Mearsheimer, my analysis is the following one. I do consider the contemporary system now in 2020 to be a unipolar one. Ch things will probably change in the future. We'll come back to this next uh, next week. Anyway, but for three decades now, the interstate system has been unipolar. And in order to convince you that this is the case, what do I have to do? I have to define power. If we want to know how many powers there are, and if we go as far as claiming there is in one one, only one power, we first have to define what power actually is. What is power? And how can we recognize one, a major power? So in mainstream international relations, mainstream social sciences, there are two concepts of power, two conceptions. First conception is the, the more traditional one, very close to the, the common sense conception of, of power. A power is traditionally defined in, the ter in terms of the resources that it possesses, the resources available to an actor. And from this perspective, then, a state, a unit can be considered as a, as a power if, comparatively to other units, it possesses more power resources. We'll come back to the details of these resources. But there is also a more contemporary, more academic, scientific conception of power, which goes back to Max Weber. Power is defined in terms of influence an actor has, that is to say, the capacity an actor has to shape another actor's behavior, the capacity an actor has to impose its will upon another actor to get it, do what it wants it to do. I will here combine the two conceptions. I think they are compatible, uh, complementary, and I will therefore make the following hypothesis. A system is unipolar. If, and as long as there is one and only one major state benefit, benefiting from such a huge gap in material resources, this is the first dimension, it benefits from such a gap in material resources that other states are led to behave the way the first state wants them to behave. Or at least 
The gap in resources benefiting the major power is such important, is so important that the other ones are led to behave in a way unlikely to threaten the major power's national interest. To put it differently, to put it differently, unipolarity exists if and as long as secondary powers do not try to balance the system. Do not try to put an end to the gap which separates them from the major powers' resources. The system is unipolar if and as long as secondary powers are unable and or unwilling and or unwilling to replace the unipolar structure, the imbalanced structure, by a balanced one, be it bipolar or multipolar. A system is unipolar as long as there is no bipolarization, as long as there is no multipolarization process on the, in progress due to the balancing strategies of secondary powers. And it is my opinion that this indeed has been the case for 30 years now. Unipolarity is the structure prevailing. The system is unipolar. It has been unipolar for three decades now because the US benefits from such an uneven, unequal distribution of power resources that secondary powers are discouraged to try to put an end to this imbalance by adopting a balancing behavior in order to put an end to such, to such an imbalance, to the unipolarity. So to prove this, I will start with the first dimension, the traditional dimension of power, and I will have a look at the distribution of power capacities, of power resources. Generally, scholars focus on two major resources. The problem with power is that to measure it, it is Joseph Nye, he will coin soft power. I will not look at soft power, at least not directly, because soft power is a liberal term, and I hear in this chapter, do apply a realist framework. Uh, Joseph and I used to say that power is like love. It's easier to feel it than to measure it. It's either to live love than to measure it. And indeed, it's not easy to measure power because there are so many elements. The Morgenthau distinguished nine elements, demographic elements, technological ones, military, economic, but also diplomatic skills, uh, the unity of the nation, the fact for leaders, uh, to be efficient when dealing on the international scene, etc., etc. So, because there are too many elements that should be taken into account and that, that we are unable to compare, scholars focus on two major resources, material resources, economic one, measured ones, measured by the GDP, the gross domestic product, and the military uh, resources, measured by uh, the military budget, the military spending. So, if we look at statistics, and I put the statistics in the document number four of the file. If you look at the statistics regarding the economic resources, first of all, the IMF data. IMF's World Economic Outlook, America's GDP in 2019. America's GDP amounted to $21,349 billion, $21,439. And if we compare the second largest, uh, GDP as measured at the official exchange rate of the Chinese currency, because it is China, of course, the second most important GDP. If we look at the, if we compare the two uh, GDPs at the official exchange rate of the Chinese currency in US dollars, this is what the majority of scholars do. Next week, we will see the alternative way of measuring and comparing the GDPs. Anyway, if we compare the Chinese one, it amounted in 2019 to 14,140. So 14,140 as compared to 21,349. In other words, the economic resources of the world's second best economy, the Chinese one, represents two thirds, two thirds of America's richness, 66.2%. I did not find any data uh, for 2020. 
maybe this is due to the COVID crisis. What is the impact of the COVID crisis? We'll know it in, in a few years or so. Anyway, so economically, America is prevailing. Militarily, America is prevailing too. If we look once again at the data, no longer the IMF, but of the CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, it publishes every year a yearbook. You can have access to it on the internet. So according to the CIPRI yearbook, in 2019, America's military budget amounted to $732 billion. $732, which represented 3.4% of America's GDP. America dedicated last year 3.4% of its richness to military spending. This military budget is superior, ladies and gentlemen, to the military budgets of the 10 following nations dedicating the most important resources to military spending. That is to say, if you take together China, Russia, Great Britain, France, India, Japan, Saudi Arabia, South Korea and Germany, if you take these nations together and Italy, they spend less than the US alone. And China itself, China's budget in 2019 amounted to 22, 261, 261 as compared to 732. So less than a third, of, no, a bit more actually than a third of America's military expenditures. So economically and militarily, America is prevailing and therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the system is unipolar. It has been unipolar since the end of the Cold War and this unipolarity is not a mere moment. As claimed by Krauthammer, it is a historical era. 30 years is significant. We now live in a one superpower world, the claim by the three American scholars, Eikenberry, Massenduno, and Woolforth. We now, we currently live in the one superpower world, a circumstance unprecedented in the modern era. No other great power has enjoyed, I quote, such advantages in the third capabilities, military, economic, technological, and geographical. So, the US is the most powerful state in the world. The post Cold War world international system is unipolar, is unipolar, unipolarity. So long for power resources, that is to say, traditional economic and military capabilities of the states, military capabilities, capacities, and economic richness. But, of course, we have to go beyond this traditional conception of power. We have to look at the st states, and in this case, America's capacity to shape the other states' behavior. What about the second dimension of international of, uh, power? Let's listen to various experts gathered by the London School of Economics and talking about America's power. <laughs> an ever greater abundance of material and spiritual values for all. That is the secret of American prosperity. Relative power really matters in international politics. What they mean by that is, you know, uh, who's got the biggest army, uh, what share of international trade do you have, who's got the baddest navy. The United States has huge amounts of assets the most powerful guns, biggest military in the world, the most advanced military, great structural power economically, it owns the dollar, you know, arguably the world's leading universities, vast allies, uh, English language, all sorts of things like that. It's still the place where you know, more Nobel Prizes are won than anywhere else in the world. And this does matter in international politics, but if you focus just on relative power, you can miss something really important. And that is what I like to call the usable power. Your ability to actually translate your raw capability, those assets that you have, those resources, into actual influence internationally. So the capacity to translate your material resources 
into influence. So what about America's capacity to influence the other powers or the other states' behavior? In order to make sure that these states' behavior will be compatible with American interests. Or at least to make sure that this behavior will not threaten, will not be incompatible, contradictory to America's national interest. So to try to provide an answer to this question, we have to look at what such a threatening behavior could consist in. And we will refer, to do so, we will refer to Kenneth Waltz's typology distinguishing two balancing strategies, states, in this case, secondary powers, eager to influence, eager to, to change the system, can resort to two different balancing strategies, internal balancing and external balancing. Internal balancing refers for the fact for states to increase their own military capacities. They spend more money on guns than on butter. External balancing consists in creating alliances or joining alliances by accumulating within an alliances all their military resources. So of course, they can do both. They can all at once increase their own resources and create alliances in order to join their forces with the other members of said alliances. So let's look, let's have a look at the behavior of secondary powers uh, for the last three decades now, since 1989, since 1991. What do we see? We see that there is no internal balancing strategy, there is no external balancing strategy by whatever secondary power. Concerning internal balancing, if we look at the evolution of military budget since the end of the Cold War, there is a general trend of states dedicating less resources in part of their richness, in percentage of their richness. States now do dedicate less a less, a smaller part of their GDP to military budgets. And to one state, which downsized less than the other one, is the US. So America's preeminence, military speaking, nowadays is more important than it ever used to be. Because, of course, during the Cold War of the USSR rivalry. America's military advantage nowadays is higher than ever. And Paul Kennedy, the British historian, who in 19, at the very end of the 1980s, predicted America's decline in his best-selling book called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, where he announced America's decline. Well, Paul Kennedy has to come to the conclusion that actually he was wrong. Listen to Paul Kennedy in an article published uh, more than 10 years after the end of the Cold War. I returned to all of the comparative defense spending and military statistics over the past 500 years, of the, over the past 500 years, that I used in the rise and the fall of great powers. But no other nations. No other nation comes close to America's advantage. No other nation. This is what Obama said. No other nation comes close. So America militarily is prevailing. No secondary state is significantly increasing its own military resources. And no secondary powers is practicing external balancing. That, there is, that is to say, there is no formal alliance, there is no informal coalition established by secondary states for 30 years now, with a view to counterbalancing America's preeminence. Sometimes people refer to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, started, created in 2001 by China and Russia and the various Central Asian republics, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. What is the objective of this Shanghai? cooperation organization, its object is regional security. That is to say, cooperation in order to try to cope with mainly the Islamic secessionist separatist threat 
in Central Asia, in the south of Russia, in southeast of Russia, and in the northwest of China. India and Pakistan joined in 2017, three years ago, this Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I do think that it is due to India's willingness to counterbalance the Chinese influence from within, from within the organization. But it is anything but the sign of an alliance between India and China. You know that two or three months ago, and even some weeks ago, a limited but nevertheless significant armed dispute broke out at the Chinese-Indian Himalaya border. Various people, various soldiers were killed. This tends to prove that China and India, of course, are anything but allies, not, neither now nor in the future. So no internal balancing, no external balancing. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important point. This absence of any attempt to consciously balance America's preeminent capabilities is the most obvious proof of today's unipolarity. In order for a system to be multipolar, the presence of various secondary powers is not sufficient. And therefore, the existence of the BRIC or the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, plus South Africa, the so-called emerging powers, the fact that these emerging powers exist does not prove that the system is multipolar. Why? For a system to be multipolar, not merely must there be three, four, five major powers, but all these powers also have to adopt a balancing behavior. They have to join alliances in order to rebalance the system, in order to put an end to the gap that separates them from, in, from the unipolar prevailing power. To adapt a balancing behavior is the condition, either by increasing one's resources or by joining the military resources. There is no such explicit objective of recreating a balance, of putting an end to the imbalance. There is no multipolarization process, in other words, and therefore the system remains unipolar. The structure of the international system for three decades now is unipolar. Let's come back to the predictions that were made with the exception of Krauthammer, who predicted unipolarity, though claiming that this unipolarity would not be that stable, not, neither uh, uh, durable, how can we explain that unipolarity prevails, has been prevailing for three decades now, despite the predictions of the best and the brightest realists, Kissinger, Walt, uh, Mirschema, anticipating a multipolar system, that is to say, anticipating a balancing behavior. Why is there no such balancing behavior? What are the reasons of the secondary state, states accepting imbalance, accepting America's preeminence? What are the causes of the durability of what we may call Pax Americana, the American peace, the American order? Why is America still sitting on top of the world 30 years after the collapse of the USSR. The answer, ladies and gentlemen, to this question is threefold. First of all, America is perceived as a benign hegemon and not an imperial one, not an imperial dominating state. Imperial hegemon, to some extent, is a contradiction in terms. Anyway, I'll come back to this. America also has the capacity to be indispensable to the secondary powers. It is either a facilitator of their interests or a, honest, a kind of honest broker. And last but not least, for some states, the Western European ones, plus Canada, plus Japan, plus Australia, etc., the Western liberal democracies, America is, America's dominance is considered to be legitimate, internalized to be legitimate. 
So let's have a look at these three points which are put forward in the LSE debate, the third video, which I referred to some minutes ago. Let's listen to the to one more minute to our experts emphasizing America's hegemony as being an inclusive order. America is many things to many people. The way in which we think about the United States as a world power needs to change. The United States no longer has the same capacity to run the world that it used to. The image of U.S. unipolarity was one that the entire world welcomed. And part of that was that the United States, even though it was the world's largest economy, it had the best, best guns, the big top military, it was the most powerful nation, it was unrivaled technologically, militarily. It did not sit on just that. The paradox was that it became ever more powerful by giving away that power. It constructed an inclusive global order that was transparent, that was democratic, and to which it invited everyone who subscribed to those ideals. So paradoxically, by making the world less dominated by just itself, it became ever more powerful. One of the entire world welcomed America's preeminence. Why? Because America did not sit on guns. You know, maybe Napoleon's statement, you can do everything with a bayonet without sitting on it. You cannot sit on a bayonet. In other words, you cannot exert the leadership, in this case, on the world stage, if this leadership is merely based on military threat, on military capacity, on military uh, constraints. So America is more than materially and militarily prevailing. First of all, America is perceived as a B9 superpower, a B9 hegemon rather than an imperial one or an imperialist one. It is perceived as a B9 hegemon by secondary powers, not necessarily by regional uh, troublemakers, if we can use this term, which is, of course, a biased term, biased by a Western or American center perspective. Anyway, ever since America decided after 45 to drop its isolationist tradition, the isolationist tradition that had prevailed from its birth <clears throat> in the end uh, of the 18th century up to at least Woodrow Wilson and actually up to Pearl Harbor at the end of World War II. Ever since America decided to get involved on the international scene, to intervene in world affairs, what did it do? It associated secondary powers to the benefits of the American order. At least it associated those secondary powers that accepted this American order. And such a great power behavior is pretty rare, actually. There's only one, ex in world history, there's only one example which comes close to the American one. It is Great Britain's behavior during the first half of the 19th century from 1815 to roughly the Spring of Nations or the Crimean War and at the beginning of the 1850s. The Pax Britannica, the British peace, was based on Great Britain associating the other major European powers to the concept, the European concept of powers, and this permitted stability to prevail in Europe. But America goes uh, beyond this negative concept of powers. It has uh, established an order, an inclusive order, and France, Germany, Japan, etc., economically speaking, that is to say, the populations in these countries are benefiting, of course, from the liberal order established by the US after 1945. To say that America established this order does not mean that the US acted um, altruistically. There is no altruism of course, in politics in general, and therefore in international politics, America's self-restraint, Heikenberry's analysis after victory, after American victory in 1945, America's self-restraint behavior, of course, was in its own interest. By acting this way, America consolidated its victory in 1945, it consolidated it on the long run. But whatever its motivation, 
by, accept, by adopting such a self-restraint and by associating the secondary powers to the advantages of the American order, America cut the ground under the feet of potential adversaries eager to criticize and all the more so eager to get rid of America's preeminence. So America is a benign hegemon rather than an imperial power. Secondly, more positively, America is indispensable to many secondary powers. Just look at what America managed to do after 1945. It defeated mercilessly without any mercy, it defeated Germany and all the most of Japan with the atomic bomb launched on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nowadays, Germany and Japan are maybe the closest allies of the US as well. Of uh, the US, sorry. Just look at Vietnam. Vietnam fought a bloody war against uh, America, or maybe it's actually America that fought a bloody war against Vietnam during the 60s, during the first half of the 70s. Nowadays, Vietnam needs the US to cope with its northern neighbor, that is to say, China rising and rising and being perceived rightly or wrongly. <clears throat> That's another question. But Vietnam has a potential threat. Look at the Palestinians. The Palestinians know that America supports, sponsors, etc., Israel for 50 years now or so. And yet, more than 50 years, 60 years. And yet, if the Palestinians want, maybe, to be successful in their uh, claim to obtain a, a state worth this name, they have to look to Washington. Remember what Obama said. States, units, actors do not look to Beijing or Moscow. They look to Washington. Look at France, whose relationship to the US is somehow ambiguous, a love-hate relationship. If France needs American military capacities, satellites, providing the French army with information when intervening in its Operation Barkhane in Western Africa. When France, Sarkozy, and Great Britain launched uh, the military bombing campaign against Gaddafi in 2011, 20, uh, 2011, after 15 days or so, after two weeks, America and NATO intervened because the French and the British no longer had enough re military resources to be successful. So the secondary powers need America. America is indispensable. And the last example I gave, France and Great Britain needing America's resources is at the origin of the third reason that I consider to contribute to explain the lasting American preeminence since the end of the Cold War. This reason concerns democracy. Western European states plus Canada plus Japan plus Australia share the same values the same identity, the same collective identity with the US. I would like to quote Nicolas Sarkozy, the French president, the former French president, one of the former French presidents in 2009, so 11 years ago, what did he decide? He decided that France should reintegrate the unified military command of NATO that had been, uh, that, that the goal had decided France should leave in 1966. And of course, when uh, uh, taking this decision, Sarkozy was uh, uh, criticized. He was criticized by those in France who claimed that France should remain uh, sovereign, autonomous, should not be um, dominated by uh, the US. The, the criticism came both from uh, the Rassemblement National, the Front National at that time, or, and from left wing. Uh, people criticizing um, the decision of Sarkozy. And how then did um, Sarkozy justify this decision? This is what he said. Listen to this. America is our ally. America is our friend. We'll come back to this quote when analyzing the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. But this term, America is our friend, implicitly or, or explicitly, indirectly, or, or indirectly, consciously or not, that's not the question. This friend, this expression, friend, means 
that America and its Western allies are more than their allies. They share the same value. They form a security community. And as in everyday life, you do not conceive of the possibility of becoming a rival in your relationship with a friend. A friend, by definition, is someone you spontaneously accept to live with and which you spontaneously help in the case of a problem. We'll come back to that. So America is the friend of different various European countries and reciprocal. And therefore, the system also is unipolar and actually hegemonic. The hegemony is a domination. Hegemony, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to remember this definition. Hegemony is a domination which is acknowledged to be legitimate by those upon which said domination is exerted. In other words, secondary powers and first and foremost, Western liberal European ones consider America as a hegemon. Its leadership is acknowledged to be legitimate and therefore it's not even questioned. A combination of these three reasons, a benign leader, an indispensable facilitator, and a hegemonic, acknowledged hegemonic power explains America's lasting preeminence. And this preeminence explains the stability of the system, the stability of the contemporary order. I refer here to William Woolforth in document number six. Woolforth is also one of the three authors editing this book. So, in international relations theory, a system is stable when there is no risk of any major war breaking out. I refer to Woolforth and I also refer to Robert Gilpin, actually. Robert Gilpin, War and Change in World Politics. A system is stable as long as there is no risk of major war breaking out. Major war, this is say a war involving all or at least the majority of major power. In other words, a system is stable when no major state thinks that it might be profitable to try to change the existing order by resorting to violence. When do states, when may, sorry, when may states be tempted to believe that they have an interest in changing the system by resorting to war? By definition, this is the case given the postulated rationality of state and of statesmen. By definition, states go to war if they think that they will have a positive utility but they expect a positive utility. That is to say, they, their situation will be better off after the war than without the war. Otherwise, it would be foolish to resort to violence if they expect a negative utility, to expect that the war actually would bring more disadvantages than advantages. So states then might be tempted to go to war if they expect a positive utility. Ladies and gentlemen, in the unipolar system, no state, absolutely no state can rationally expect such a utility. And therefore no state considers the possibility to go to war. And since no state considers the possibility to go to war, there is no risk of major war. And if there is no risk of major war, the system is stable. Why does no state have a positive expected utility in a unipolar structure? Well, I give you the answer. Because of the unequal distribution, the secondary powers, first of all, the secondary powers, by definition, 
are weaker than the preeminent one. Their military resources, we saw the, the data half an hour ago, their military resources are small. Therefore, they cannot rationally bet on the victory. So they cannot expect the positive utility. So they stop short from resorting to violence. No risk of war emanating from the secondary power. So you will, will say, I guess, the preeminent power by definition, being powerful and being the strongest, can be tempted to go to war since it may expect an easy victory. Yes, but, but it is in relative terms that the expected utility is measured, not in absolute terms. That is to say, an expected utility of going to war is positive only if it permits states to obtain what diplomatic means do not permit said state to obtain. Now, let's look at the preeminent power. The preeminent power does not need to go to war. Why? Because its mere reputation to be the most powerful one permits it to constrain, at least implicitly, the other state's behavior. There is no need for the preeminent power to resort to violence because its reputation as being the major important power, the major, as being the most important, as being the major power, permits it to impose its will. It does not need. And what's more, complementary argument, what's more, the preeminent power has no interest in going, in resorting to violence. It has no interest in doing so because by doing this, it would precisely incite the secondary states to increase their own resources and to create counterbalancing and that counterbalancing strategies, counterbalancing alliances. So it would be foolish for the preeminent power to resort to violence against secondary powers because such a behavior precisely would be counterproductive. The secondary powers would feel threatened. They would no longer consider the preeminent power as a benign hegemonic leader. They would consider it, rightly so, as an imperial power. And therefore the US exactly acts rationally, rationally since World War II when it adopted a self-restraint behavior. So this is the philosophy, this is the, the, the theoretical uh, reason why the contemporary system is, uh, is um, stable, the unipolar system is stable. And this analysis is corroborated indirectly by the um, realist theory in the meaning of realist philosophy, the realist tradition, which is at the roots of the analysis the power cycle theory that I do apply in this chapter. This philosophy, this realist uh, roots, these realist roots, were uh, proposed three and a half centuries ago by Thomas Hobbes, the British philosopher in his famous Leviathan. According to Thomas Hobbes, you may know that, in the state of nature, men are wolves to other men. There is never ending state of war. Every man is eager to dominate and maybe even to eliminate every other man. And this is due to human nature. They men by definition are, according to Hobbes, evil, jealous, aggressive, eager to dominate. And this Human, these human characteristics end up in provoking the never ending state of war for a very specific reason. Listen to Thomas Hobbes, I quote, nature has made men equal. Nature has made men equal. In the faculties of body, strength, and in the fac faculties of mind, smartness, as Nature has, man, has made men so equal in the faculties of body, I quote and mind, as that the difference between man and man is not so considerable. 
men are equal. From this equality, I quote, I won't quote you, from this equality of ability arises equality of hope in achieving our ends, since we are roughly as strong and as intelligent as other men, we do think that we might prevail in a, an armed struggle with another man. I go on claiming, therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. Men become enemies because they roughly are equal in physical strength and in smartness. In the way to their end, to obtain satisfaction, what do men do? They endeavor to destroy or at least to subdue one another. So the state of nature among men is synonymous with the state of war because men are equal and they have roughly the same hope to obtain satisfaction. Hobbes applies his analysis of the state, of the state of nature among men to the state of nature among nation states, political units. Logically then, if two states are equal, roughly, if there is a balance between two states, then there can be no stability because the two states are likely to be tempted to believe that they might prevail in an armed conflict which amounts to saying that stability only can exist when there is a power gap, a gap in the power resources. If one is stronger or if one is smarter than the other one. And therefore, peace prevails within the system because of the Leviathan, because of the sovereign representative, because of the central government, which, which prevails in a community, in a society, within a nation state. There is no such leviathan, there is no such overarching authority, central government, might we say, on the international scene. Therefore, if the structure is balanced, there is a risk of never any state of war. How then can this state of war come to an end, at least temporarily? How can stability prevail? Thanks to a kind of ersatz, a substitute of this world government, which does not exist. And this substitute is provided by the strongest unipolar hegemonic power. So as long as there is a hegemonic power, stability will prevail. Theoretically, philosophically, and empirically, this, is what, this was the case. If we go back to the past centuries, we'll see more details next week, but I can already very quickly sum up. As long as multipolarity prevails, as long as the shifting alliance this strategy prevailed among major European powers roughly from the beginning of the 16th century and all the more so after 1648 up to 1815, Napoleon's defeat, the system was unstable. Regularly wars were breaking out between major powers. Since 1815, thanks to the British preeminence, the British victory against Napoleon and then the British preeminence, the system became stable throughout the 19th century. Stability prevailed among major powers, with very short and limited exceptions, the Crimean War and the wars of the Italian and above all, the German unification. A World War I and then World War II broke out in 1914, 1939, because of the British decline. The British decline, synonymous with a bipolarization process. No more unipolarity. And the British decline, and it's with America's rise, thanks to its victory during World War II. America became the preeminent power as early as 1945. But the Soviet Union, of course, rejected this order. Soviet Union rejected this order. It tried to compete with the US. It competed militarily, but it was unable to compete economically and therefore 40 years later, at the end of the 1980s, the very beginning of the 1990s, the USSR collapsed because of this kind of contradiction due to a huge military apparatus and a very weak economic 
uh, richest economic system. So ever since then, America, materially, at least economically prevailing as early as 1945, became unipolar and hegemonic, that is to say perceived as the leader explicitly in 1990 up to now 2020. And therefore, since 1945, ladies and gentlemen, and the more so since 19. 89, the system is unipolar and above all it is stable. Stability prevails. No major war broke out. We are living in a period of long peace. We, that is to say the major European or the major, not, not European, the major powers in the world. The contemporary interstate system is unipolar and therefore durable and therefore stable. There is a long peace prevailing among major powers. There were various wars launched by these powers, but these wars, I would say, were chosen wars, not necessary wars. They were chosen wars because the security, the survival, the integrity, the sovereignty, the independence of the major powers was not at stake. Neither when the USSR intervened in Afghanistan, nor when the US intervened in Vietnam and all the less so in Iraq, or in Libya, and the same is true for France in Libya again, and also in Iraq and Syria, and nowadays in Mali in Western Africa. So the system nowadays is unipolar, and therefore it is stable. Will this go on in the future? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the question that we will have a look at in our chapter two, when we're analyzing the rise of China and its consequences upon the international system. So long for Today, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed my class. I wish you a great day and hope to and hope you come back uh, next Thursday, which therefore will be no more sad. Goodbye.